thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. I'm Lindsay. And this is episode 30. 30. 30 weeks and counting uh, the, my, with the, my, the My Story fan submissions. I think we've shared over 100 paranormal stories so far. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. It's very, very cool. You're good at math. I'm good at math. I'm okay at math. Thanks to all you creeps and peepers who continue to listen, continue to watch on YouTube. Those of you new to the show, especially those of you who have come over from Time Suck, quick reminder about the point of view of this show. Time Suck is a place for me to be extremely analytical, skeptical. Scared to death is a place for me to let that go and just think, I don't know, maybe I wasn't there. A fun place to suspend disbelief. Good little escapism. I like it. And uh, and really quick thank you to Will XX, the, the guy who did the ink on my uh, my left forearm here. Uh, Black Salt does his artwork on Instagram. He gave me coffee when I was down before all this crazy stuff happened in Utah, getting some uh, tattoos. And he gave me Black Rifle coffee. Wow. It just started hitting me about two minutes ago. Oh, dang. Are you hopped up? Hopped up. If this Uh show is terrible, uh, Will XX ruined it. (laughs) Oh, no. I've heard it's really strong, and I actually have heard about it for a long time. I don't think I've ever had any before this morning. And this is the dark roast, and I'm like, ooh, good thing I didn't go with light roast. So I should never have it. Never. It'll blow your head off. Because I I don't know if you guys know, I don't drink any caffeine, so (laughs) yikes. Okay, okay, noted. Uh, (laughs) Quick, important uh, merch announcement. Oh, yeah. Monopile, our distribution manufacturer company, like many places, ordered the shelter in place due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, April 7th is when Spicy Club, our merch management team, have been told they'll be able to resume production and shipping. Come back, come back. Possible they could open earlier. You can still order as normal from the store. Just expect, of course, a shipping delay because we appreciate the hell out of your support more than ever during these strange times. Each order of $50 or more during the quarantine will receive a free special edition uh, coronavirus koozie and stickers when this is all over. So thank you so much for all your support of Bad Magic Productions. Logan and Kate at Spicy Club say, stay safe, y'all. And really cool hoodie. Uh, hitting. So cool. Bad, yeah, Lindsay and I love this one. Badmagicmerch.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not this. I, don't be jealous. I'll talk about this later. <laughs> this is not it. Uh, tattoo kind of biker art vibes. Reminds me of a motorcycle club cut. A black hoodie, skeleton hand, holding a flame on the front. Skull and other artwork on the back. Uh, you can just check it out at badmagicmerch.com. Very, very, very cool. This hoodie was given to me by a fan in Nashville mm. right before the coronavirus took yes. us all down. Yes. Yes. I love uh, it. I don't, can you it's really? Very cute. Don't fuck with the crystals. Don't fuck with the crystals. She ha- I wish I could remember her name. In my mind, it's mm. Sam, but then there was also a girl, Mariah, behind her, but like she's yeah. tall, thin, short hair, very pretty girl. Not, not that it matters, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> But anyways, don't fuck with the crystals, hand-painted, and if I was completely in the dark, it would glow in the dark. Awesome. Very cool. Thank you so much. I'm very cozy. And then same shows, we also got this uh, deer skull with the um, Viking runes carved into the head that glows. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Uh, Very cool. Little thing for the occult uh, desk motif situation we got going here. I know. I just got a ton of new crystals from people, and they were charging in the full moon and in the sunlight and all the things that I have to do to make them ready to go. Mm-hmm. Charging or sitting on a shelf. Hey, story time. How, uh, Lindsay, how many stories do you have today? <laughs> I have a lot of fuck you, Dan stories. Okay. I have two. Two? Two. I have, guess how many I have? Oh my God, do you have two? You nailed it. Uh, yeah. You nailed it. First story, creepy little tale of two <laughs> unwanted visitors. This is what's happening, guys. This, this is coronavirus in full <laughs> effect. We're making our own fun. First story, creepy little tale of two unwanted visitors showing up late one evening yeah. on an elderly Vermont couple's porch. Can I just, sorry, just before you dive mm-hmm. in, can I just tell you? Yeah. I've been having a really hard time sleeping. I really feel like something is in our house again. I know. And I am not looking forward to doing the show today. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm freaked out already. I feel you're uncomfortable. On edge? Oh, you're not going to like this. First so one at all. I just want to let you know like, I could hardly sleep last night. I was crying as I fell asleep. I oh, was my God. Okay. so tired and so like, huh. Can I share what's going on with you and your body right now, too? Is that because I know you get more emotional? Oh, yeah. 
Well, I mean, I just know yeah. that that's not like a like a thing. Like some guys, yeah, like, yeah. oh, is she on? You know, it's like. Yeah. But you do get more emotional. I do get more emotional during hormonal, my time of the month. Right. But like, I'm it. I mean, let's get into it. I'm towards the end of it, so yeah. normally it's like right at that's the beginning. True. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know. It's a stressful time too. Maybe maybe, it's maybe just there's different stress. things. Yeah. I've been drinking more at night. Too. Oh jeez. <laughs> I'm trying to get through it. Okay. So, anyways, <laughs> I just wanted to say that I am on edge. Okay. I'm gonna get this cozy. This is gonna help. Yeah, you get cozy because there's not a lot of setup for this first tale. Really right, none. Cool. Thanks, Dan. But I'm, it's uh, I'm ready yeah. to never sleep again. Two unwanted visitors showing up late one evening, elderly Vermont couple's porch that they should have not let in. Second story, pretty well known exorcism tale: the 2007 exorcism of Julia, as uh, an, an unusual exorcism, and that it was witnessed by an Ivy League educated psychiatrist. So we'll find out how a highly educated skeptic became a believer in the paranormal. All right, so you ready? You got your socks? Yeah, you I, sh- your I just showed him off while you were talking so no one could see your face. <laughs> Great. Okay. You ready? Oh, God. I'm really not. Okay, fine. Let's do it. Make the fans happy. Time now for the tale, Never Let Them In. Several years ago, in late January, in a snowy town in the midst of a hard winter, a town somewhere in the middle of nowhere, Vermont, an elderly couple, Stanley and Jean, heard the sound of three loud knocks on their front door. Jean jumped a bit, startled. Instead of walking over to open the door, she instead walked into the kitchen where Stanley was washing a few dishes before the two were to go to bed for the night. It was almost 9 p.m. The couple wasn't expecting any visitors. They never had unexpected visitors that late. The sun had set four hours earlier, and they lived on a large property with a long driveway leading to their front door. Mm -hmm. They would always know when someone drove up to their home after dark because the headlights would have to shine directly into the large bay window in their living room. And if someone they knew was stopping by, they'd almost, you know, always call first. Right. None of that happened this night. So whoever was knocking had most likely walked. Extremely unusual for someone they didn't know to walk uh, over a hundred yards or through over a hundred yards of darkness to knock on their door. Stanley cautiously peeked through the bay window and saw two children, a boy and a girl, standing on his doorstep. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Neither looked over the age of 11, both stared down at the ground. Uh -uh, Uh-uh, uh-uh. Stanley, who had a few grandkids around the same age, told a still spooked Gene, it's just a couple of kids. And he walked over and unlocked and opened the door. He worried that something terrible must have happened to them. Nope. When he looked at the kids, the first peculiar thing he noticed was that neither of them looked back up at him. They kept their heads down, continuing to look at the ground. And then the boy asked, or maybe the girl, or maybe both. It was hard to tell for some reason. Parents will be here soon. May we come in? And they continued to not make eye contact. They just stood there in the doorway. Oh my fucking God, no. Stanley and Jean hesitated a moment. Jean shot Stanley a concerned glance and actually shook her head no, which surprised him. She's smart. This was weird, sure, but they were just kids. And he welcomed them inside. Of course, come in before you catch cold. I hate him. The kids settled on the couch and Jean retreated to the kitchen to make some hot cocoa. While his wife put some water on the stove to boil, Stanley asked the kids some questions. So who are your folks? Why are they picking you up here? Is everything okay? Do you need to use our phone? All of Stanley's questions went unanswered. And then he heard a low growl from across the room. It was Charlie, Jean's tabby cat. And yes, it was Jean's tabby. Stanley wasn't really a cat guy, but he did like Charlie. Charlie was the most good-natured, friendly cat he'd ever spent any time around. Charlie liked everyone, and he teased Gene that he was going to take off with the first person who offered him a can of tuna. But Charlie did not like these kids. Charlie stared at them intensely, fur along his spine, standing straight up, steady, low growl in his throat. Stanley had to admit to himself, he didn't care much for these kids either. Why'd you let him in, jackass? Gene returned to the living room to ask the kids still sitting silently on the couch not answering the questions that Stanley asked, staring down at the floor if they wanted marshmallows in their hot chocolate or not. Just as she noticed that Charlie the cat seemed spooked and hostile, the children, one or both of them, spoke, May we please use the restroom? Jean told them that of course they could, and she pointed out the closet bathroom, or the closest bathroom, first door on the left down the hall towards the bedrooms. When the kids stood up, she got a look for a moment at their eyes, or more accurately, at the spaces, the voids, where their eyes should have been. I fucking knew it. The children's eyes were as black as a starless universe, unnaturally black, less of a color and more the absence of color, the absence of anything at all. Jean quickly looked at the floor herself after seeing those black spaces as the kids both walked past her and down towards the bathroom. Jean was scared now. 
She didn't know what these two things were, but she knew they were not kids. When the bathroom door shut, Charlie shot across the room past Jean and retreated into the laundry room behind the kitchen. Jean wanted to hide as well. She looked now to Stanley, who was covering his face with his hands. He asked, good God, did you see their eyes? And then he moved his hands away from his face and Jean saw they were covered in blood. Stanley had a terrible nosebleed. She didn't remember him ever having a nosebleed like that before. Just then, the power went out. Oh, God. The house turned as dark as those kids' eyes. Stanley whispered, Jean, go back in the kitchen. I don't know what those two things are, but they're not. Stanley's whisper was cut off by the sound of the bathroom door creaking open. In the stifling silence of the cold, dark, lightless night, they heard the footsteps of these two kids, these two whatever they were, these two black-eyed children, walk out into the middle of the living room. Jean and Stanley both stood silently in fear. They could hear each other breathing, but they couldn't hear the breathing of these two children. Stanley and Jean would later reflect that unless they were speaking, the two kids didn't make any sound at all. Fuck. One or both of the black-eyed children broke the silence. Our parents are here. And then they all walked to the, or they both walked to the front door. The kids opened the door and exited the house, leaving the door wide open. The two children walked out and down the driveway towards the street, and then they just vanished. Whether they vanished into the darkness of the night or literally vanished from the face of the earth, they couldn't tell. The moment they disappeared, the power came back on. Oh my God. Stanley and Jean would never see the two kids again, and their lives would also never be the same. Stanley continued to get horrible nosebleeds, and when he went to the doctor a week later, he had some blood work done, and when it came back, he was sent to an oncologist. <gasps> he had a nasal tumor. He had brain cancer. What? It was a particularly aggressive type, and he died within the year. No. Charlie the cat didn't last nearly that long. They found him the morning after their encounter with the black-eyed children. He died while hiding near the ceiling on top of a cabinet. The vet said it looked like he'd had an embolism of some kind. Jean thinks he died of fright. <sighs> She's convinced those childlike things with the black eyes killed both her cat and her husband and thinks they'd both still be here today if they would have just never let them in. I'm so mad at this story. Yeah. Well, first of all, I fucking hate black eyed children. Mm hmm. Why, why, why would you let them in? Kids. I don't give a fuck. It's the middle of the night. It's fucking creepy and weird. Creepy and weird, but if you didn't the see their eyes of, at first. And in the middle of nowhere? Okay. Right, rural, rural place, but I think all, all, the, the, more all the more reason to let kids no, in. No, no. If the kids showed up at your, our house, you wouldn't let them in? Absolutely not. Especially after not doing this show. <laughs> Before this show. Yeah, probably. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I'm such a like scaredy cat about stuff like that. I have severe stranger danger. I don't know. Would you let him in if you like put a gun to the kid's head? Just like the whole time they were there? <laughs> I'm kidding. Maybe. <laughs> I, do, I do like guns. <laughs> okay, no, this is what it makes me think about though. So... Growing up in Ohio, yeah. uh, my aunt lived in this town called Homerville, and okay. it was like pretty out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Her and my uncle moved there after like some very terrible family things. They just wanted to be away from society. Yeah. So they lived down this long, dark road. Like you would go down yeah, this yeah, like yeah. country road. It was Got paved, it. right? I mean, mm -hmm. but no stop signs. You know, the speed limit was probably like 60. Uh -huh. And then you would pull off. Like, just from the main road right into their driveway. And there were, you know, several driveways. But yeah. again, you know, like, one here and then one, like, yeah. a, you know, half a mile down the road. And then they had this long gravel driveway. And I was imagining their house this whole time because yeah. if a car pulled up, it would illuminate the house through the bay windows. Yeah. Like, it, it was, I was like, oh, oh shit, my yeah. God, was this my aunt and uncle? Like, also, my uncle died in, like, a freak accident. Did they let something in? And we never found out. They're, now they're both deceased and I can't ask. I mean, but maybe it fucking freaked me out. Like the same thing, like oh, yeah. hallway. I just, I did not like that. Made me think of my mom's house where like in the sense of being isolated, where like how weird, uh, you know, several hours after the sun went down, if two kids just showed up like a- No fucking way that we're answering the door at your mom's house. No way. I know that would be so weird. But That'd then, be but so then weird. I will say in the defense of this couple, you would, you would also think like, oh my God, did something terrible happen for these kids to be showing up here? Grownups? Different story. I disagree because, because. She would not let kids just stay outside. If we were at your mom's house, are you kidding me? Because it's not like your mom's house. It's like. What are you going to say? Just fuck, get out of here. Beat it, kids. No, I, maybe I would sit outside with them. 
or you know what I mean? But I'm not letting them into my space. I would call the show. I would call the cops first of all. I would say like, okay, you stay there, and I would like make up an excuse like, hey, I'm a grown up. You're Mm -hmm. a kid. I don't want to be accused of anything. You can sit right here on my front on my porch. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna call the cops, and we're gonna you know get this sorted out. And then I would maybe like stay outside with them. Okay, what if you saw their eyes though? Like so, so for, like because you're spooked because this legend, and then they didn't have black eyes; they had normal eyes. You probably let them in. I still wouldn't understand what they were doing there. It just doesn't make sense to me. Right, right. It's, uh, yeah, it's creepy. Okay, well let's. Okay, I don't want to do this. Today. Little little picture, first picture <laughs> I don't from the Vermont couple. Let's look at this. Uh, we don't lighten it up. But um, bum mm-hmm. with Vermont. Ben and Jerry's. This is uh, my favorite Ben and Jerry. Uh, the fish food. It's my favorite what? flavor. I love fish food. Okay, let me just say we have been together for what, like eight. I haven't minutes? had it in so long because it's, ne- so it's so many, so many calories. I know. You've never eaten it. It's uh, a th- one thousand. Your fucking favorite. What are you 1, talking about? One thousand one hundred sixty calories. I know there's another one we like, but I love fish food. Caramel, chocolate, and then um, marshmallows, chocolate ice cream, marshmallows, caramel, and little dark chocolate fishies. Okay, what is amazing to me is that like when you make a sundae at home, you have vanilla ice cream with chocolate syrup on it. That's like you can you can add those things, and you don't even like marshmallows. Who are you? I know, but I like fish food. I just haven't had it in so long. Do you like the band Fish? Nope. I mean, I've never gotten. That was definitive. I, okay, my reaction there was because I had friends when I was younger who were so into fish. So into it. And they pushed it too hard on me. Got and it. And so the expectation was built up so much. Yes. And then I listened and I'm like, this is a fucking 10 minute guitar solo that I don't want to hear. That happened to me with Dave Matthews Band. Okay. Like high school, all my friends were so into it, like so into mm-hmm. it. I was one of those people. Oh, and there was this guy. I, oh, he was a naughty, naughty guy. And he tried to get me to like them by flirting mm-hmm. with me. And he had a girlfriend the whole time. Okay. And then it really made me hate Dave Matthews. Uh, why? But, but I'm, but I'm back in. I'm back yeah. in. And, and, and I've heard fish since. I, I bet now I'd be like, oh yeah, okay. I get it. I get it. Do you like my stalling? Do you like, want to hear like, more stories? I like bands like Dispatch and stuff that are similar a little bit. Um, here, Let's get to another picture. This is a better pick. The, <gasps> oh, that's not ice cream. That's a black eyed kid. Ah, oh, bummer. That kid I shut, just, if that, fuck. If that kid shut that, up your door, I get not letting him in. That kid looks like Joe's son. Okay, so here is one of my favorite pictures from this story. That's uh, the best like I could find. Uh, this has nothing to do with the story. This when I found the first ice cream picture. This is one of my favorite pictures on the internet. I saw it years ago for the <laughs> so first time. Weird. It's so weird. This is a picture. If you're just listening, <laughs> this will be on Instagram at the uh, Scared to Death Podcast Instagram account <laughs> and Facebook. But this is. I don't understand I know. what's happening. What's happening is it's it's a girl. She's having an ice cream cone. <laughs> And, the, and, the, and, it's, and it's soft serve and it goes up to a point and she has rested. She went in for a bite and she went in at the wrong angle and the tip of the ice cream went right up her nose. But also she's not holding the cone. This feels so very she, she, staged. She's balancing it. It's just, it's one of the, I don't care if it's staged. It's one of my favorite pictures on the internet. <laughs> and, and I came across it when I was looking for the Ben and Jerry pick. Okay. Okay. See a little lighted up a little bit let's, before we go back into in darkness. Let's this space. Nope. No. Okay. Okay. This next story, a little bit of setup. I can't tell you how much I don't want to do this. I'm so freaked out. Okay. okay. It's, well. You're not sleeping tonight. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. <laughs> so this next one, uh, I feel like most of us like to believe that there's a hard line drawn between the world of paranormal and the world of science. Yes. Comforting to think that there's the unexplainable, the stuff that happens in the dark, things that are seen in isolated places where there are few witnesses, the stuff that happens when you're alone and you can later rationalize it as a product of your own overactive imagination and nothing more. There is that world... And then there was the stuff on the other side of that hard line, the explainable science, the stuff that takes place in the daytime, the stuff that happens under halogen lights, stuff examined by professional people with impressive degrees, wearing white lab coats, performing careful, controlled experiments. Every once in a while, these two worlds collide. Oh, dear. Not often, maybe not in the lab, but from time to time, someone from the world of science wanders over to the world of the unexplained and is forever changed by what they discover. I really don't like where this is headed. This next story is about one of these discoveries. (sighs) In the last few decades, the Catholic Church has observed that cases of demonic possession have definitely been on the rise. I don't want to go to church right now. The United States is now home to over a hundred so-called stable exorcists. Those who have been designated by bishops to combat demonic activity on a semi-regular basis, a number up from just a dozen a decade ago. In 2010, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops organized a meeting in Baltimore for clergy interested in how to deal with cases of possession. 
In 2014, Pope Francis formally recognized the IAE, the International Association of Exorcists, 400 members of which convened in Rome in October 2016 to talk about cases of possession they'd witnessed and exorcisms they'd performed. And in 2017, the Catholic Church published the first official English language translation of a ritual book on exorcisms. The church hopes the book will make it easier for priests who are otherwise good exorcists, but feel hindered by a centuries-old requirement to use a Latin text for exorcisms. Having it available in the vernacular and the common tongue means priests can concentrate on prayer and on the ritual without needing to worry about working in another language. The book, called Prayers Against the Powers of Darkness, is available now in Spanish and several other languages as well. And all of this begs the question, how many exorcisms are being performed right now? Thousands. Tens, if not hundreds of thousands of exorcisms are requested each year now. Fuck me. I and, don't want it. And thousands are performed. An official exorcist in Indianapolis, just one priest, received over 2,000 requests just in 2018 alone. How many? 2,000. In Indianapolis? Just this one guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 uh. And every once in a while, one of these exorcisms is not performed with only clergy present. Sometimes priests will bring in someone from the world of science to assist. Time for the tale of the demonic possession of Julia. Oh, God, I don't want to. In 2007, Richard Gallagher, MD, a board-certified psychiatrist, was employed as a professor at the New York Medical College in Valhalla, New York, one of the nation's largest private health sciences universities located less than 30 miles north of Manhattan. Dr. Gallagher was also on the faculty at Columbia University, the prestigious Ivy League school located in Manhattan's esteemed Upper West Side. He graduated from Princeton another Ivy League school in the 70s and then got his degree in psychiatry from yet another Ivy League school, Yale University. This guy's a genius. Yeah, needless to say, Dr. Gallagher is very smart. He was also, prior to his involvement in the exorcism of Julia, very much a skeptic. He'd been raised Catholic, devoutly Catholic, actually, but he began to per but when he began to pursue his collegiate education, he lost his faith. Sure. And then one night in 2007, he was in his office working late when he got an unexpected phone call. The person on the other end of the line introduced himself as Father John. He said he was a priest and he had a serious problem he needed Dr. Gallagher to help him with. Father John said that a woman came to his church he'd never seen before. She called herself Julia and she begged for his help. Julia claimed she was possessed and that if she didn't get help quickly, she was worried that she would die in a matter of days. Dr. Gallagher asked what his role in all of this was supposed to be. Father John explained that all over the world, the number of people claiming to be possessed was mounting, and the church was worried that this might be due to people fabricating possession claims. He explained that the church was well aware that many people who claimed to be possessed were actually suffering from mental illness, drug addiction, or any number of other non-spiritual conditions. The church wanted to avoid performing unnecessary exorcisms for a variety of reasons. Okay. It wanted to avoid being seen as medieval, irresponsible, pushing superstitious fixes for conventional ailments that should be treated by doctors and not priests. Mm -hmm. The church saw itself as being compatible with the world of science, not opposed to it. Okay. okay. And Father John felt that Julia, with her dyed black hair and black makeup and piercings and overall goth appearance, fascination with the devil, was likely not afflicted by anything spiritual but that she was likely suffering from a psychological affliction or from something related to drug abuse. Maybe she just liked the attention she got from making a claim of possession. That's where you come in, Father John said. He explained that he wanted Dr. Richard Gallagher to evaluate Julia. If Richard could give her a psychiatric diagno diagnosis, then he wouldn't pursue performing the exorcism. He also told Richard that if he did agree to take her case to be very careful, if there was something evil lurking inside Julia, it might and likely would do everything in its power to trick Richard. He also warned that Julia might have memorized a list of symptoms of possession and would try to trick Richard into approving the exorcism just so she could indulge whatever dark curiosity she had in the occult. He had to watch her very, very carefully. Over the phone, Father John couldn't see Richard smirk and roll his eyes. What's more, said Father John, out of the many thousands of consultations I've done, only about a hundred were actually possessed. Many more than that, however, have suffered from oppression which are physical attacks and harassment from the devil as opposed to taking actual possession of a body. What? We must try to get to the bottom of this. Yes, there's possession and oppression. I did not know this. What you're saying, it defies scientific reality, said Richard. He explained to Father John as respectfully as he could that he didn't believe in the possibility of a demonic possession or demonic oppression or harassment. He didn't believe in demons, the devil, none of it. Now was Father John who smirked and rolled his eyes. 
He asked Richard to humor him. We strongly believe that we are not dealing here with purely material reality, but with the spiritual realm. One cannot force these creatures to undergo lab studies or submit to scientific manipulation. They will also hardly allow themselves to be easily recorded by video equipment, as skeptics sometimes demand. Richard explained that if he were to meet with this girl, he would not be looking for any supernatural origins to explain her behavior or mental state, and Father John seemed pleased by this. Well, he said, if we thought you were easily fooled, we would hardly have wanted you to assist us. Richard reluctantly agreed to help. It sounded to him like this Julia, whoever she was, was seriously suffering from something. Richard always thought that if requested to help a tortured person, a physician should not refuse to get involved for any reason. Those who dismissed cases such as hers prevented patients from receiving the help they desperately needed. For any person of science or faith, it should be impossible to turn one's back on a tormented soul. Father John made an appointment in Julia's name, and then as soon as the priest hung up, Richard's skin began to crawl. What had he gotten himself into? The next day, while he waited for his appointment with Julia, he felt butterflies in his stomach. He was spooked, and then he was mad at himself for feeling spooked. He laughed out loud in his office. Did he feel a bit afraid? Mm-hmm. Of what? At three o'clock, he heard the receptionist outside say, Name, please. Julia, someone replied. Just, uh, Julia. When she entered, Richard thought she looked like someone he might wait in line behind at a local coffee shop. The kind of place with great beans and poor customer service. <laughs> the kind of place that was proud not to offer Wi-Fi. A place where you could be sure to hear bands like Neutral Milk Hotel and Bell and Sebastian and never hear any Top 40. Julie was in her mid-30s with jagged, shoulder-length black hair, plenty of ink and piercings. She looked like she could work at a record shop, maybe a tattoo parlor. They exchanged pleasantries and Dr. Gallagher could tell immediately she was intelligent and didn't come across as someone desperate for attention. Like someone who wanted people to think that she was demonically possessed because it was cool. She was independent. She wasn't married. Had supported herself since college. She didn't seem at all to be the kind of person who would ask the church for help. She was engaging and lucid. Didn't And he didn't see any initial obvious signs of drug abuse. So why, Richard heard himself asking, did you go to Father John for help? Julia bit her lip. I was raised Catholic, she said. When I was a teen, I got pretty rebellious. I wanted to give my parents a big fuck you. So I started getting involved with these groups. At first, it was just teens messing around. But then some of them got really serious about it. It got to be like a cult. We didn't see anyone else. We only worshipped him. Uh. Who, Richard asked. Julia's eyes seemed to brighten as she said, Satan. Richard, unfazed by this admission, continued, so you were in a satanic cult? More than one, she said. When one died down, I would find someone else who would worship with me. We would sacrifice animals. Oh my God. Burn effigies. Sometimes we drank blood and ate raw meat. Fuck. And we prayed to him a lot. That he would use us to accomplish whatever he wanted to fight against the church. She fixed Richard with an even stare and then it got out of control. What do you mean out of control? I mean, I truly believed in the power of Satan, but I also believed in myself as an individual. But I started feeling not like myself. I would be doing one thing. And then come two hours later, alone in a field or somewhere, naked and bruised, with my feet bleeding, as though I'd walked miles. Ugh. That was at the beginning. I lost more time. I think I remember a couple hours of every day now. Richard stopped scribbling his notes. You only remember a few hours every day? She nodded. He breathed a huge sigh of relief. This sounded like a straightforward case of disassociative identity disorder. A couple more sessions and he could give her a diagnosis. He smiled at her. They talked for a while longer about her past. In the last few minutes of their session, Richard walked over to his desk to put away his notepad. And then when he turned around, Julia was different. Her back was rigid, her shoulders hunched, and she was twitching like a dog with rabies. Stupid fucking priest. She growled in a low, guttural voice. Leave her alone. She's ours. Oh, my God. Julia? Richard asked tentatively. Julia convulsed, sliding down in her seat, her eyes darting across the room. Her hands were like claws gripping her skirt. After a few brief moments, she shut her eyes, and when she opened them, it was the same mild, detached stare that Richard had seen for most of their session. When she spoke again, her voice was normal. What? She asked him. And then she looked at her watch. Oh, shit, I'm late. Bye. And just like that, she left the office. Richard stared down in his notes. That voice he heard, how could it have come from a small human woman? Over his next few sessions with Julia, he heard the voice again. It was like Julia would slip out of her body and something else would take her place. Leave, the voice would bark at Richard. After talking with Richard or Father John following several sessions, Richard agreed that something strange was going on. He'd seen disassociative identity before or disorder before, but this was different. 
He wasn't willing to say demonic possession. He still didn't think that was possible, but he also didn't know what this was exactly. John and Richard decided to get a group together to discuss Julia's case. They figured the more people they had, the more witnesses, the sooner they could both figure out what they were in fact witnessing. Father John contacted four Catholic priests, a deacon and his wife, two nuns, while Richard called several colleagues in the psychiatric field. They decided to get all of these people together on the same conference call to discuss Julia's case and arrange a gathering if, if an exorcism was recommended, which he doubted. Julia was not asked to be on the call for obvious reasons. One by one, each person clicked in. Hi, right, Sister Mary. Dr. Simmons here, and so on. And then right when Dr. Gallagher began to discuss Julia's case, they all heard unmistakably this growling voice, Leave her alone. She's ours. What? Richard almost dropped his phone and then asked, Did you hear that? Yes, said Father John. Everyone else also heard it. Huh. Did anyone add her to the call, Richard asks. Before anyone could respond, the voice said, Idiot, leave her alone. I'm warning you for the last fucking time. Oh then my God. Every single line went dead. The group jumped back into the conference line and Julia shut it down again. When Father John began to speak, she screamed, leave the girl alone. And the line went dead once more. Oh, I don't like this. How was this possible? They all heard her voice, but no one heard her chime in. Was Father John setting him up, he wondered? Was one of the nuns actually Julia? Richard was feeling paranoid. If they weren't setting him up, then something unable to be explained by science was going on and he did not want to accept that. He badly wanted anything other than a supernatural explanation, but that was getting harder and harder to find. In subsequent sessions with Julia, things would start out normal. They would talk a little, like she was going to ordinary therapy, but then she would often slip into a trance and shout at him in that strange, deep and guttural voice. And even more disturbing to him when she wasn't in trances, Julia seemed to know things she just couldn't have known. She knew how many children Richard's secretary had where the secretary had grown up. She knew that one of her children was sick. Oh no. She knew similar information about people she'd never met. She knew the family history of one of the nuns that Father John had contacted. One day, Julia described not only the actual surroundings, including the decor of his room, but the exact state of mind, which was skeptical and dismissive, of a priest that Father John had contacted, one whom neither Julia nor Richard had ever met. Julia could also consistently depict from hundreds of miles away with amazing detail the activity of one of the principal priests involved. She would repeatedly report from her distant vantage whether and when he was in pain because he suffered from a chronic illness, where he was, and remarkably, even what he was wearing at the time. A blue windbreaker, she would say. He's on the beach. He's feeling good. What? And then one day she fixated on Richard with a soft, sympathetic look. She said, oh, sorry no. about your mom. Ovarian cancer is a rough way to go. How did Julia know this, Richard wondered. It made no sense. There was no way. He hadn't talked about how his mom had died to Father John or Julia or anyone else he assumed she could have met. Still skeptical, Richard wanted to find out if someone was feeding Julia information. And then she told him something he had told no one. The night before a session, his cats had been running around all night, meowing, growling, hissing, darting through the rooms of his townhouse, waking him up. It was like something only they could see was constantly spooking them. I don't like that. The next day in a session, Julia flashed him a sinister smile and asked, Dr. Gallagher, how did you like the cats last night? Oh my God. How could she possibly know that? Get the fuck out of here. Richard decided to conduct another little experiment that day to convince himself one way or the other as to whether something supernatural was going on. After Julia fell into her trance and began to moan in a deep guttural voice, he threw water on her. Water he'd been telling her was holy water. It wasn't and she made no negative reaction to it. She laughed. Then, when she didn't seem to be looking at him, he secretly splashed a small amount of water on her that had been blessed by Father John. Uh -huh. She immediately went berserk. Her <gasps> eyes rolled back in her head. She started clawing at herself and on the floor. She snarled, stupid doctor, oh don't God. do that. Oh my God, oh my God. Richard then brought out a small cross and showed it to Julie. Is this what you're fighting against? He asked, shut up, the voice growled, fuck you. In that moment, a vase fell off the shelf on the opposite side of his office, smashed on the floor, followed by several heavy books seeming to throw themselves off the shelves. Oh my God. Even more strange, some of the pages of the book seemed singed, and there was a smell of smoke and burning in the air. Following the end of his therapy session, that would be the last one, Richard called Father John. In my medical opinion, he said, barely believing the words coming out of his mouth, this woman needs an exorcism. The skeptic, the Ivy League doctor, had finally been convinced disassociative identity disorder did not cover books flying off shelves and the ability to decipher water from holy water. Not only did he actually recommend an exorcism, he wanted to be there for it. The exorcism of Julie began on a warm day in June. Oh dear. Despite the weather, the room where the rite was being conducted deep in an underground room of a nearby cathedral, very, very cold. 
As soon as she walked into the room, Julia fell into a quiet, trance-like state. It was as if her body, it was as if she had vacated her body. The thing inside her hadn't woken up yet. The priest tied her to a bed so she would be unable to hurt herself. And as Dr. Richard Gallagher watched, they began to pray. Holy Lord, all-powerful Father, eternal God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you who are destined that recalcitrant and apostate tyrant to the fires of hell, you who sent your only Son into this world in order that he might crush this roaring lion, look speedily and snatch from damnation and from this devil of our times, this woman who was created in your image and likeness. Throw your terror, Lord, over the beast who is destroying what belongs to you. Give faith to your servants against this most evil serpent to fight most bravely. Let your powerful strength force the serpent to let go of your servant so that it no longer possesses her whom you deem to make in your image and to redeem by your son who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit as God forever and ever. As soon as he spoke, Julia started to writhe, her body twisting and straining against the ropes tying her down. She made animal-like noises, growling deep in her throat. Her pupils narrowed to slits. Unclean spirits, this priest commanded. By the mysteries of the incarnation, the suffering and death, the resurrection and the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the sending of the Holy Spirit and by the coming of our Lord into last judgment, I command you, tell me with some sign your name, the day, the hour of your damnation. Obey me in everything. Although I am an unworthy servant of God, do not damage this woman or my assistants. Despite this prayer, damage would be done. With a flick of her wrist, Julia slammed a 200-pound priest into a nearby wall. There was an audible crack, and the priest slumped over unconscious. Oh, my God. This image would haunt Richard. Nothing in the scientific world covered anything like that. With it, while a few people ran over to the priest to get him out of there into a hospital, the voice spoke. Stop, you whores! It said to the nuns who were bent over the priest. Stop, you sluts! We'll be sorry! Huh? Then the voices spoke in Latin, Spanish, and French. They cursed and ranted for hours. But Julia never seemed to grow hoarse or need water or tire. The room, which had been so cold, began to grow hot and smell like garbage left in the sun like sulfur. The heat and the stink soon became unbearable. As Julia screamed and screamed, her body rose until she was levitating a foot in the air. Holy shit. Levitation definitely not covered in Richard's psychiatric diagnostic manual. What he saw was stunning. As she rose, she cackled, her body convulsing with the force of her laughter until she had almost bent in half backwards. The priest threw holy water at her and it sizzled in the air. They shouted prayers over her screams. Whatever had taken over Julia began to reveal secrets about each person in the room. You abandoned your poor sick father, she hissed. He's all alone in Connecticut, wondering when you're going to call, but the cancer will get him before you do. Oh. She revealed painful secret after secret for hours, reducing several of those present to tears. And then, after they finished the first exorcism, Julia's eyes fluttered open. Now with her normal round pupils... They asked her if she remembered anything. No, she shook her head. Oh my God. I don't remember anything. Julia would go on to have eight exorcisms in total. Holy shit. Each one a couple weeks apart. Each time the presence inside of her lashed out with just as much venom as it did the time before. The exorcisms were not working. When Richard frustrated asked Father John why it wasn't working, Father John replied, True possession can sometimes be taken care of in just one exorcism. Other times it can take years. It can depend on the willingness of the victim to help themselves. The exorcism makes the demonic hold on the person weaker, but the person's response also influences the outcome greatly. Julia wasn't fighting back hard enough mm. because Father John thought that some part of her liked having this powerful demon inside. A part of her didn't want to let it go and return to a normal life. Crazy, but it does make a kind of sick sense. Most humans crave some sort of power. And this demon, it did give Julia a power she couldn't hope to have without it. She's playing both sides, Father John said. Still possessed, Julia abruptly quit after the eighth session. And then a year after Julia had dropped out, she called Dr. Gallagher out of the blue, asked him to convince Father John to resume the exorcism rituals again. I'm dying, she said. Richard, of course, made an appointment for her to meet up with he and Father John, but then she never showed. Oh, no. And he never heard from her again. And now Richard wonders if Julia is still out there somewhere, still possessed. Has the demon finally killed her? Oh my God. Or does she still live with it inside of her? And which fate is worse? No resolution? Nope. Oh God, I hate this so much. <laughs> that story really got you. That's I did it. not care for any of that. I forgot that I didn't have my amulet on or my sage necklace. I had to grab it. 
I was worried about you losing your shit in that story. I felt like I was going to cry. I know. I was worried about that. I could sense it. <laughs> oh, oh, why? Oh, man. Well, okay. A couple real. Okay. This first, this is Dr. Gallagher. <sighs> I couldn't. There was like on the okay. web, there's pictures that are like JPEGs. And then there's like these web images that you can't show on the slideshow. And there was like more professional looking pictures. But whatever. Whatever. You know, that's him. That's yeah. him taking a selfie in a mm-hmm. garden. Cool. Mm-hmm. So that was the you know, best picture What up, Dr. Find. G? So highly educated dude. Um, this next picture is Julia. Uh, the best picture I could find of her. That's Winona Ryder. That is Winona Ryder in Beetlejuice. <laughs> There's no picture. She was anonymous. Julia. Uh, I was like, what? But right, that's kind of who I was picturing. It's like a, a little, little kind of like that. I guess. Yeah. You know, one of the best movies ever, by the way. Beetlejuice? Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Why would you do that? I would love little Beetlejuice right now. He was funny. Little Michael Keaton, Beetlejuice? Come on. You're such a fucking idiot. You can't do that. <laughs> it's a movie. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is next image. This is just, uh, this one comes up with it. I think it's a stock image of a possession. So it might be from a movie. Yeah. It just comes up with a story. Fine, whatever. And then last one. Yeah, no, no crazy. This is uh, Father Gary Thomas. And this is just a priest who worked with Dr. Gallagher. When I was okay. talking at the beginning about uh, the Catholic Church, you know, having more active exorcists. Is oh, that the Indiana guy? No, but this is, well, actually, uh, I don't remember where he's from. No, but I think he's California based, but he's one of the most known U.S. exorcists right now. And actually, I, I never saw it. interview him? Maybe uh, he might. Yeah, he's um th- that movie, The Right. It's a 2011 exorcism. It was Anthony I Hopkins. I saw it. Oh yes, I saw. I that. didn't see that, but he, th- that's who it's based on. Yeep. Anthony Hopkins' character is based on this guy. Nope. Well, you know I can't watch scary movies anymore. Like right. this podcast has single handedly yeah. ruined my ability to watch any <laughs> scary movies. It's just all too fucking real. I've been I've been I've been craving lately um that uh, Netflix haunted I think it's called the one with all the true supposedly true stories. It freaks me out, but I, I like getting back into the mood of it. I'm getting more back into being uh, embracing my creepdom. I was going to tell you to go live somewhere else, but I don't want to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll watch them <sighs> on headphones or something, so you can't hear it. I don't. I don't want you to watch it at home. What are you talking about? Don't bring that shit in my house. <laughs> okay, bro. I'll watch it. I, you won't even know, bro. 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 That was awful. Okay, but maybe she did want it because she maybe. she never, I never thought of that angle before. Well, she never said. I mean, to our knowledge, she never said that like she regretted joining those satanic cults. She mm-hmm. never said that she left them. Mm-hmm. She just said it got more and more out of control. That it went like to another level. But right. she didn't necessarily. Again, based on what we know, she yeah. never said she was ob- objective to that. Or right, ob- unless I miss yeah, it. That, unless that I was so yeah. scared. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, she wanted. I mean, it sounded like you know, like what, from what we got from the story, that she uh, didn't like how far it had gone. And was like worried about losing herself, excuse me, in, like in, in this kind of uh, whatever this thing was taking over her. Yeah. But I just think that's an interesting, you know, perspective on this or, or argument that maybe some people don't really want it to go away. Like part of them does, part of them is freaked out, but another part of them might like the attention. Another part of them might like the power they feel if like they can like uh, see things they couldn't normally see. <laughs> me. I think you would like it if you were possessed. If it was the right demon, if I, if you like, if we had like an arrangement, you know. <laughs> If you guys had a deal, if we had some kind of deal, no, I, I think I get that, certain powers. I think that you would like it. I do. I think that you would be like, okay, this shit is real. If I could shoot fireballs out of my hands <laughs> at people, at my enemies, that has never been reported. I know, but I'm, hey, we're just going with fantasy world. If I'm being serious, I could, I could like incinerate I take seriously. people. Seriously, you don't take no. It I am. Seriously. I am. I am. If I can incinerate somebody, that's not, why can't that be my power? Because that's just something. That's not something what? we're aware of. All right, what I kind of power do I get? You don't get power. Then that sucks. Why would I want to be possessed then? Because I think that you would like the attention. I wouldn't like the attention. You would love it. What You're an attention about? whore. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm a left to love, be, leave me alone whore. I know. Me too. It's sort of a problem. <sighs> I just that really. I didn't like that little demon voice you were doing. I know. Oh, that really got me. I know. Why would you do that to this me? This is a scary show. It's supposed to be scary. I want it. I was worried about it. I was, I, that was the first time I was like, oh, man, she's going to snap. <laughs> I, was, I didn't look at you as much, that show, because I was like, oh, she's going she's gonna to start crying. I, and I'll oh, feel bad. I was legitimately crying last night. I couldn't sleep. I know. I don't know what you're... You know, you don't know that I was crying last night because you went asleep. to sleep. I know. Because you suck. <laughs> Because I'm awesome. No, no, because, okay, so last night I like said to you, I was like, babe, and I wasn't even being dramatic. I I said like, I don't know what it is. I'm just having a really hard time sleeping. And it it really could just be like, we are clearly all in a very stressful environment. And even though we're not personally affected in the sense that like our families are healthy, our children are healthy, like, you know, Mm? yeah, we lost 
a, you lost your job temporarily, mm-hmm. but like, you know, that we're dealing, right? Just like just like everybody yeah. else, right? Okay, but like all somewhat manageable things. I don't know if that is like subconsciously weighing on me. I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but you were. I was nicer. See, in my defense. Kind of. No, hold on, hold on. You put me in, like in a no-win situation where I'm like, you're freaked out, and I'm trying to tell. I'm like, you're gonna be fine. I'm like, nothing's happened to you ever in your life. In that situation, the odds are that's gonna happen now are very low. And then what and did you, you do? And you kept saying no because you kept saying you don't know. You know, and so what can I say to that? And then I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know what to tell no, you. No, what then. did you say? And you, I fell asleep. No, you decided to start making jokes. What did I do? I don't remember joke. Yeah. Joke. I made. Oh, okay, okay. See how invested but, you but are. But I can't. But I can't comfort you if, if you're yes, like, you well, you don't yes, know. You then yes, there's nothing I can say. Yes, you can. You could. You could hold me and say like, baby, it's okay. I'm here. If something happens, if you get freaked out, it's okay. You can wake me up. Like you would have said last night. You're like, you couldn't stop it. So that's not the point. You have to keep being reassuring. Okay. And you have to tell me that it's going to be okay and that you're there and that you'll protect me. And that if I wake up in the middle of the night, because I've been having terrible dreams. Remember the last couple of nights I've been like, God, I'm having the weirdest dreams. Mm-hmm. And that, I used to have such vivid dreams when mm-hmm. we first started dating. They all involved you being very terrible human being. Of course. <laughs> I'm sure that, that was just like relationship insecurity kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, but you, like last night, you could have just said, yeah, like, well, if something wakes you up. Just let me know. It'll be okay. Because under these circumstances, you could go back to sleep. It's not like those annoying times when you have to get up at four in the morning to catch a flight to go do stand up somewhere. I could wake you up, but you didn't offer that. All right, you can wake me up. Oh, now that I pressured you to. But you were making jokes that, that I had two doodles and the doodles will protect me. Exactly. The dogs will protect you. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. I talked it's about, not funny. I t- it is funny. It's not funny. I talked about how they're a new breed and scientists haven't and paranormal people haven't studied them. And for all we know, Australian Labradoodles are the key to stopping Satan's power. <laughs> Maybe. You don't know. That's their that's their main quality. People thought they were just like super cute. No, they're fucking, they're God's chosen warriors. Oh, now they're God's chosen That's, warriors. Yes, of okay. course they are. <laughs> well, anyways, if there's like a big, powerful man who wants to snuggle me and tell me that I can wake him up in the middle of the night, <sighs> there's a job position available for you. Oh, man. Yeah, I just invited somebody else to our bed. Sweet. Well, if that person comes over, I want them to bring uh, some sexy lady who's just like doesn't get fucking bothered by this stuff. Fine. Deal. Uh, bring, bring the two you of them over. You guys can sleep upstairs. Sweet. I'm keeping our bed. We're not even going to sleep. Good for you. <laughs> All Hi. right, tell your story. High five, bro. Hey, bro. This fun, bro. Um, okay. Well, I was really scared, and now I'm just uh, that. We, we can recap a little yeah. bit more on that, but it just, I, I mean, that felt very, very real. And the fact mm-hmm. that it was unresolved. Mm-hmm. No, but you said at the beginning that it's a very famous haunting. Is there like yeah, a relatively, movie? Is there uh, a movie based just on Just a lot it, of articles. Or? Just okay. I mean, it's got a, it got a lot of press because of the guy's academic prestige. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you remember earlier in one of your stories, there was like a tapping at the door, the black eyed children, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there was like an animal involved. I've got more of that for Mm -hmm. you. The cat. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want your squishy? I got my squishy. Do you want to cross? Boom. Nope. It's really comfortable to hold on to. I like this guy. Okay. Okay. Well, for this story, we are headed to rural Kentucky. I, I hate how so many stories take place out in the middle of nowhere. Just really, because mm-hmm. we kind of live in the middle of nowhere. Anyways, you know that Kentucky used to be called Devil Tucky for a long time. It did. No, I thought it was. I believed you. <laughs> so really convincing. I know. It was really. I really sold that. <sighs> you are a hilarious, Dan Cummins. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Dan, Lindsay, Reverend Dr. Joe, and Penny Pooper. That's our dog, for those of you who don't know. And the rest of the gang. When I heard you give out the email and the opportunity to send in stories, I just knew under absolute circumstances I had to share my story with you two and the creeps and peeps. So with no further ado, let's get into it. I was 18 when this started. My father had just passed away, and life was not all roses and sunshine. Rather, it was mostly overcast and crabgrass. A month had gone by since the passing of my dad. I was asleep one night in the early hours of the day, and I awoke in a cold sweat, panting for breath, scared and confused. I was in my bedroom that I had spent my entire life in, but when I opened my eyes that morning at 3 a.m., I had a feeling that I just couldn't shake. Eventually, my yellow lab, Dixie, kissed me out of my confused state, and I was starting to come back into reality. Everything around me became familiar again, But one thing was certain, I was not going to fall back asleep. 
I was clueless as to why I was in such a state. I laid there, flipping through the channels, and then it all started coming back to me, piece by piece. I've always had vivid dreams, to the point where I'd constantly have to ask, did that truly happen, or did I dream that? And in this instance, it was no different than many times prior, as the memory of my dream placed itself back together like a broken dish played in reverse, the image of an old man stuck out in my head. Little by little, other details became more and more clear. I saw a set of eyeballs looking at me through a window as I slept. I heard a thud of something metal crashing onto the wooden deck that was directly below my window, and as one would assume, those terrifying images became present in my mind, and I shut my eyes and did my best to forget them. However, against against my best attempts, the next few nights all started and ended the same. No matter how hard I tried, I would wake up in the same state around the same time four nights in a row. Each night I laid there, the dream kept replaying over and over in my mind. The creaks and groans of my old empty house grew louder, and it seemed as if they were happening more and more and causing my dog and myself to freak out. On the fifth night is when I took is when things took a turn for the worse. I refused to go to sleep this night. I told myself that with the power of three pots of coffee <laughs> loaded with sugar, I was staying awake and breaking this cycle. No matter how hard I tried or how much sugar with a splash of joe I poured down my gullet, I fell asleep only to, yep, you guessed it, wake up around 3 a.m. out of breath and confused of my location. Mm -hmm. But this time, my dog wasn't in my bed with me, and my window was open about half an inch, and the blinds were pushed up at the bottom, all going in different directions than the rest of the blinds. Dixie! I yelled over and over for my dog as I was frozen in fear. I didn't want I did not want to get out of bed. It was December in Kentucky and it was cold as balls as well as a big dump of snow had hit us throughout that day and that night. When she didn't come to my calls of her name, I made myself get up. Mm-hmm. I turned the corner from the hallway and saw her standing in front of our big picture windows that went from ceiling to floor at the front of our house. She was standing there making a low, grumbling noise. Her hair was razored up along her spine, and her front paw was lifted off the ground and pointed towards the window. I froze in my tracks and called to her once again, but it was as if she didn't hear me at all, and that was not her character in the slightest bit. Again, I called her name, Dixie, Dixie, and this time I raised my tone nearly to a screaming, and she turned around and looked at me, and as she did, there was one single tap on the window Mm -hmm. just one this sent her into hysterics as she went forward towards the window pulling the drapes down with her standing there in front of my window was an old pale man pale as a hospital gown almost glowing mind you there was no port light porch light on my house i'm in rural kentucky where the closest neighbor is a half a mile i'm sorry is a mile and a half away and there was no reason that i should have been able to see every wrinkle on this old man's face get the fuck out of here you stupid son of a bitch i yelled as dixie was steadily barking and biting at the window but he never acknowledged me he just stood there with one finger on the window looking down at my dog i ran to my bedroom which was about six running leaps away grabbed my shotgun As I turned back into the front room, I made sure that he saw the gun as I cocked the slide. He and I made eye contact. It was the same glassy, yellowish, pale green eyes that I had seen in my dream looking through the window. Like an old movie recurring, my dream was playing over and over in my mind as I slid the deadbolt back on the front door, turned the lock, and turned the doorknob and flung the door open, letting Dixie run out in front of me as I leveled the shotgun towards this man's face. (laughs) He was gone. Dixie was sniffing around the snow on the porch where he was standing, and the only thing there were two footprints in front of the window in to the front room and two foot, footprints under my bedroom window. There were no prints leaving, and there was a good two inches of snow on the deck. The weirdest thing is that it was if he had been standing there before the snow had started Mm. because there was nothing at the bottom of the prints other than the wooden deck. No sunken shoe prints like mine. Not a trail to where he had broken the snow to step there or anything. He just simply was gone. I still live in this house. You should get the fuck out. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I have never had this happen again. Dixie was never the same after that experience. Sadly, I lost her later that next summer. She died mysteriously at the age of three. Yeah. She was a healthy as a hog dog one day, and then the next I came home and found her there, in front of the window where that strange encounter had happened. Dead. Still to this day, I'll close my eyes and see his grin and those liver-spotted eyes and chills run through my soul every damn time. I hope you enjoyed this. I suppose I've lived it, so someone else may as well get something out of it. Everyone I've ever told just looks at me like I'm some crazy person and says, oh, bless your heart, honey. <laughs> and then I'd imagine they talk about me when they get home. To be clear, I don't drink or do, dr do drugs, so I know what I saw and no one can take that away from me. Your biggest fan in Kentucky, Cody. Wow, Cody. I, that one I was wondering like if it was the, I, I expected it to be the dad. But clearly not. But clearly not. Just because of that detail earlier in the story. I thought that's where it was headed to. And I like, as I started to read the story, I was like, oh, it's just going to be his dad. It's going to be this like maybe potentially sweet right. story of his dad coming back and like maybe warning him about yeah, something. Yeah, but yeah. then as it went on, I was like, eek. Yeah. God, yeah, that's so, that's, uh, the creepiest detail to me was the um, footsteps going all the way down to the ground. Yes, that it must have snowed around him. And in two different spots by mm -hmm. two different windows. I thought it was most creepy that the dog died in, in the that same spot. spot where he saw that old man or whatever. Weird stuff, all, all of these things. When you, look at, when you look at all these stories in their totality, just like, what the fuck could be going on? I don't know. I mean, could it just be really lucid, vivid dreams and then happenstance his dog just dies? My mind goes to the craziest places sometimes with all this. And, and, I, and I'll think of like, the, the, we're living in a matrix and this is all a computer simulation. Is that because we've been watching Westworld? Are you thinking of two parallel worlds? Mm, maybe. I've thought of the Matrix thing for a while. I remember when it started, but that's a theory that's out there. A lot of people think about it. Like, and, and not just like 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 wackadoodle lunatics, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, Elon Musk. I mean, there's a Those lot of- Those guys are wackadoodles. <laughs> a lot of speculation that we're living in some post-humanistic uh, Matrix situation, like, a, like essentially like a VR video game. And that some of these things are just like glitches in the game. Well, I hope that whoever or, is playing... Or people manipulating the game. I hope whoever is playing and, like, I'm their avatar. Don't can, don't ramp it up. I'm just leave it right here. I'm good. <laughs> Please. Oh, man. Okay. Are you ready for one more? I am. Okay, now this story, at the end, we're going to have some audio. And we're going to oh, listen okay. to it a few times over because it's a short clip. Okay. Uh, and you have to really pay attention. Okay. Okay? So it's a short story, but uh, the clip is, like, what did me in. Okay. Okay. Hey, Dan and Lindsay. I started as a fan of Dan's comedy, eventually finding Time Suck, and then was thrilled when you both started Scared to Death. Yay. It really makes it interesting as I'm walking my dogs in the dark at night. Oh, I bet. You are brave. Or... Or just awesome brave. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to give you some insight into my story. Like Dan, I've always been skeptical, mm -hmm. but several years ago, I had the fright of my life. I apologize ahead of time if this story is a bit long, and, and, and it's really not. At the time, my husband and I were living in the Denver area with our two kids, a girl who was three and a boy who was one. Both kids shared a bedroom, and my husband was working late nights at a movie theater. Like most three-year-olds, my daughter fought me constantly to go to bed at night. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of tears and crying <laughs> until I think she eventually wore herself out and fell asleep. Uh -huh. we've, we've all been there. Yeah. She would scream and cry that there was a monster under her bed, and I just assumed that this was something that all kids dealt with. A year later, my husband and I moved to Colorado Springs to be closer to family. My daughter continued talking about the monster under her bed to the point where she gave it a name, Top. She mm -hmm. played with it in her room like an imaginary friend, spoke to it at night. Mm -hmm. My husband had also seen blurs of movement out of the corner of his eye from time to time. Okay. Other examples of something in the house would be that another time when I was cooking, I couldn't find the salt. Mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't until dinner was done that I found the salt container in, of all places, the freezer. Cups were always turned upside down in the cabinet that were normally flipped right side up. Things like this happened quite a bit in this apartment. Also, during this time, my husband and I were fighting almost daily. Screaming matches and arguments about everything and yet nothing all at the same time. 
One night, my mom offered to watch the kids so that my husband and I could have a night together. We decided to have a few drinks and then watched Ghost Adventures on TV. (laughs) Afterwards, I said, let's go see if we can find Top. We had a ghost box, which we used to walk around our small apartment. We also had an old video camera that we set up on a table in the kitchen, a room we never entered during our ghost hunt. And that matters, okay? Okay. To give you some perspective, the camera sat on the table in the kitchen, and we were never than four feet close to the camera. About an hour later, after finding Diddly Squat, we decided to end the hunt. My husband took the audio from the camcorder. The camcorder didn't record video. They only used it for audio. Okay. And tried to analyze it on the computer. The audio I have attached to this email has not been edited or modified in any way. We are no AV experts in any Hmm. way and wouldn't even know how to do that. In the audio, you can hear me say, cars? Question mark. And the clicking of the ghost box. After that is when the speaking starts. I'm not entirely sure what the audio says, but I do believe it ends with, help us, please. Uh. When I heard the audio, I freaked the fuck out. I felt exposed and scared all at the same time. Was something always in my house watching me? And worse yet, was this thing attached to my daughter itself? I immediately Ah. salted every inch of the outline of my house because I was so panicked. Good choice. Mm -hmm. I whispered over and over and over again for it to leave my house. Go into the light. I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew I didn't want it to be there with something. I didn't want to be there with something else. The next day, I went to my mom's house to pick up the kids. And upon bringing the kids home, my daughter ran into her bedroom closet and started wailing. I ran in. What's the matter? I said, he's gone. She replied, what are you talking about? Top is gone. Where Mm -hmm. did Top go? Whatever was there was confirmed to be my daughter. Whatever was there was confirmed to be gone by my daughter, and things in the house soon returned to normal. Dishes stayed where they were supposed to, spices stayed in the spice drawer, and my husband never again saw those shadowy movements. Mm. My daughter only talked about Top like a friend who had moved away. I had to write the story in because I just finished the episode, Please Stay, where another listener and Lindsay both talked about seeing a bright light in their bedroom while sleeping. When I asked my daughter, sometime later, to draw what Top looked like, she stated he looked like a tall man with a bright light on his head. The light was so bright that she could never see his face. And I said, well, then how do you play with him if the light is so bright? And she replied that the light wasn't always bright, only when she was sleeping, and that during the day, he looked just like a young boy. However, if you listen to the voice in the recording, that is not a young boy's voice. I moved out of the apartment shortly after all of this and into my own house. Top didn't follow us like I believed he did when we moved from Denver to Colorado Springs. Top really was gone. Anyways, love the podcast. Love you guys. Thanks so much for giving us all the humor and horror and keeping us all a little sane in this wild world. Liz Theron. So Thank you, Liz. Joe, producer Joe, is going to cue up the audio. Okay. Okay, so just and, as a... Re- and Zach working as a producer. Oh, yeah. Great. The script keeper from Time Zach Stuff. Zach Flannery. Zach Flannery. Okay, so just as a reminder, mm-hmm. first we hear her say cars. Okay. And then we hear the clicking of the ghost box. And okay. then it speaks. Now, it's, it's only about like, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds. Okay. Okay, producer Joe, are you ready? I am ready. You guys ready? Okay, yeah. yeah. And I'm, I think we're probably going to listen to it a few times. Okay. 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 I'm, guess, I'm guessing on the volume. Let me know if you need me to turn it up. Okay. 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 Cars. Hmm. Do you hear that the second time? Help us, please. Yeah, let's, let's listen to it one more time a little bit louder, please. Okay, yeah, and then just before we go, while Joe cues that up again, so I, I'm assuming what Liz didn't explain in this email is I think that they're both saying cars, because I, I hear the husband say it, and then I hear her say it, and I think that's sort of like a, a word for them to say so they know where the audio is starting, just like a one word, like, oh, so okay. I hear the husband say cars, I hear Liz say cars, uh-huh. and then I hear like uh, the click of the ghost box, uh-huh. I hear the static of the ghost box, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and then I hear a like something yep, yep, inaudible yep. and then I hear help us please and then I hear it again help us please that's okay, what I hear you hear it twice okay okay I'm, okay. Gonna, I'm gonna listen very intently okay and I'm, and I'm moving past that first initial squeak I think okay okay, okay. 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 yeah 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 thank you drums. all right here okay, we go here we go mm-hmm. cars
That second one, I mean, now I don't, it's like the power of suggestion. I am the skeptic in me is coming out, but this, the last little audio does really sound, I mean, if you're listening for it, yeah, very much to me, like, help us, please. It does. It absolutely does. And I just like that Liz yeah. says, uh-huh, I like that she says, like, she's a skeptic, you know, like, she really mm-hmm. calls it out and just, like, and says that, you know, they... I think what got me the most about it is that when they were doing it, they didn't hear it. So they were like ghost hunting in their own home looking for their daughter's imaginary friend top. And then later are like, oh, probably, you know, let's just like check and see if we got anything. That story almost kind of makes me sad for the ghosts. Like, like what a bummer if you, okay, you can become a ghost. Let's say, (laughs) let's say you can become a ghost and then you're stuck somewhere and you need to get to some other place. And you're you're like like there's people around and you can sense them. You're like help me, come on, help us. She did help him. She told him to go to the light. Oh yeah, okay. and that oh, is the, okay. that is the thing. Like if we're going to just like suspend our beliefs for a minute, right? Right. right. If you die and you get stuck and you don't necessarily know that you're die that, that that you've died, you feel stuck between reality and death. Like let's say you're in the in purgatory, if you will. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about it in the Catholic sense. Yeah. Just using it yeah. as what the word means. You're stuck in the in between. You're stuck in the unknown. If somebody tells you like it's okay, go to the light, leave here. That might be all that they need. That is mm-hmm. a theory that yeah. like they just need to be told it's okay to go. Yeah, <sighs> spooky stuff. One spooky more time. Stuff. One more time. Okay, for the okay, okay, okay. It's that last one. I can't understand anything before that. Just like, but the Almost last like that first one sounds like like it's our house or it's my house. Ooh, Ooh okay, okay, okay. One more time. One more time. Oh I know this God. is not okay. that exciting okay. if you're watching. Although you, I mean, you can hear you can it. Hear it yeah. But like, yeah. Oh man. I just hear that last. I, I heard the I heard house I I, I, I hear oh, what you're man. saying Joe like it could be like this is our house or this is my house oh, well thanks for sending it oh, oh yeah could yeah. be could be it's, it's ah. my house thanks again, for sending an audio that was a nice that was a nice something different yeah oh man and, and also again why is it always a boy oh yeah weird I mean well we've had a few stories not the listener ones not the my stories but a few yeah. stories that happened like yeah little girls but yeah well I did get an email from somebody who said something to the effect of like uh maybe uh like it's it's disguising itself as a boy you don't you don't know really what the spirit could yeah, be it yeah, could be it could be female it could just appear to you as male uh when it's an old man and a little boy uh, this was specifically on that one because we had that little boy, um, the family in Queens in their apartments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a terrible story. Um, but they were saying like, well, what if the old man and the little boy are one in the same? Because it, mm-hmm, it seems mm-hmm. that they don't often appear together. You often see the old oh, yeah. man separate from the little boy. And so maybe the little boy is there to draw you in, make you trust it, yeah. think that it's good. And then the old man is evil. Right. Well, that's what's scary and fascinating about all of this stuff is we just don't know. We just don't know what any of this stuff is, you know? So who knows? Who knows what rules exist? Who knows what could be out there? You know what I know? What? I know that I'm not sleeping. I was doing so well for you so were. long. You are doing good. I was good. doing really great. Mm-hmm. And then um, I've gotten a couple emails and met a couple people who were having a hard time sleeping, yeah. like night terrors or whatnot, and um, families that casually, and families who very much so believe in the power of crystals. Uh-huh. And so they had... Uh, gotten clear quartz, which I have some up here, and they would put it under their pillows, uh-huh. and uh, the the quartz turns entirely black. Like, right, 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 about right. That. Mm-hmm. So then oh. I, oh my god, you're gonna think I'm insane. I already do. Cool. Okay, so I have a, a decent sized piece of clear quartz, and I was putting it on our headboard, uh-huh. just on my side of the bed. It's mm-hmm. nowhere near you. Don't you worry, your little black soul, and. Uh, I had taken it down because I was we have a fabric headboard and I was cleaning and I vacuumed the headboard as one does and I forgot to put it back and I was having terrible dreams and nightmares and then I put it back. I didn't have any nightmares last night. Okay. 
I, my brain just went to a place of I just want to get a bunch of obsidian, and mm-hmm. re- if, if I, in a perfect world, I would match all of your crystally things mm-hmm. with equally sized pieces of obsidian. You clearly don't know what obsidian does. It's, it's bl- no, but it would make you think everything had turned black. That's the point. They I'm are, trying to they're make. not even the same shape. I wouldn't even believe you. I oh, know the difference right. in the uh, the content, the way it feels, the way it oh, looks, great. the makeup of the different crystals. Please stop sending my wife crystals. Oh my God, you guys, she's, I got so many. Look at what's you guys, happening. You guys, her sanity is hanging by a fucking thread right now. <laughs> I mean, I just, I don't even know like how coronavirus could happen with all these crystals around. Because they don't do anything. Hey, uh, you guys, uh, please keep sending in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com for everything else. Info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Could I interject uh, please, for one second? Please send your crystals up your asses. Thanks for listening. Or what? I just wanted to say one thing about um, the My Stories. I've been meaning to say this for a few mm-hmm. weeks because when we were meeting fans after shows, they were like, oh, I want to send my story, but like, I'm not a good writer. Send it. Oftentimes, just send it with like a, like a precursor of like, hey, I'm not a good writer. So like, I'm good at cleaning up like the sentence structure. I'm not oh, going to okay. change your story, but please don't be afraid to send it in just because you don't feel like you're oh, the yeah. most prolific writer. Because there have been a few that I've gotten. And again, they've come with the caveat of like, hey, feel free to clean this up. So I yeah. just I just rearrange sentences. I never change the story. Mm-hmm. It is still the integrity is all there. Yeah. But, you know, like not all good, of us. Mm-hmm, good announcement. Yeah. Like yeah. we're not, we're not going to like add details. No. But if you are worried about like just sounding stilted or whatever, we're happy to clean it up. Yeah. You know, as best we can. We're not the best, you know, either. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. I'm, I'm no author. I'm no Stephen King, but. <laughs> I'm referencing that joke. You're welcome. Nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks for listening or watching Scared to Death Bad Magic Production. Thanks to the Bad Magic Productions team. Zach Flannery uh, on, on the board as well as Joe today. Learning that. Harmony Bellacamp, social media. Joe Paisley, uh, also I just said, you know, uh, producing. No, so- Joe. Sophie Evans, helping, uh, you know, to find more creepy stories. And then Zach Cohen, Jeffrey Montoy, and Joe Paisley on the sound beds. Heather Rylander, my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. She's handling those emails. Sending ones over to Lindsay. Uh, follow us Facebook, IG, Scared to Death Podcast. And uh, su- subscribe to Bad Magic Productions and enjoy your nightmares. Creep some peepers and stay safe out there while... You are scared to death. Okay, bye. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death.